Welcome to another edition of Hey DT. Hey DT is a series of videos I do where I respond to viewer questions and comments. These viewer questions and comments, they typically come from the comments on the videos posted on YouTube or Odyssey. Sometimes these questions and comments come through email, sometimes through social media such as Mastodon or Reddit. And the very first question I want to respond to is, Hey DT, how would one turn their Arco Linux install into a stable version of Garuda Dragonized that actually works with more modern GPUs, unlike Garuda? Well, that's a really tricky question because you can actually turn Arco Linux into Garuda, right? You can enable the Garuda mirrors, the Pac-Man mirrors, and essentially you would then be installing packages from the Garuda repos rather than the Arco repos. But I don't recommend people doing that. I don't recommend ever changing mirrors in any Linux distribution from the standard distribution mirrors because when you do that there is a very high likelihood that you can actually break your system. Now if despite my warning you still want to go ahead and actually turn your Arco Linux into Garuda Linux, uh, Arco Linux actually does make this rather easy because the creators of Arco Linux, they have created the Arch Linux Tweak Tool. And you can install this on any Arch-based distribution, the Arch Linux Tweak Tool. And inside that tool, they have a number of different Arch-based Linux distributions that you can tick on or off whether you want to add that particular distribution's repositories into your pacman.conf. Now, again, I don't recommend anybody doing this. I mean, it, it, if you're an advanced user and, and you accept the risk, that's great. Just know that playing around with some of that stuff can be dangerous. What I would strongly urge you to do is instead of doing that, either uninstall Arco and install Garuda Linux the proper way, or take your existing Arco Linux installation and just install the same packages that Garuda installs out of the box. You mentioned that it actually works with more modern GPUs, so find out what kernel and what video drivers Garuda is installing and just install those same versions of those packages on your Arco install. For example, I know that Arco installs the standard generic Linux kernel, where Garuda installs the Linux Zen kernel. Well, just install the Linux Zen kernel on Arco. But if you do decide to go the route of trying to transform your Arco Linux installation into Garuda by changing the mirrors, I strongly recommend making backups first. Moving on to the next question. This question was actually a rather lengthy post. I'm talking about multiple paragraphs. I couldn't read the whole thing, but there was one part of his lengthy novel that he wrote that I wanted to share because I thought it was an interesting comment. He writes, Hey DT, Linux isn't difficult. People make it that way because they don't know how to share their knowledge. That's the problem with Linux. There's so much information, it's difficult to find the info you need for routine tasks. I would argue that that is not the case, that uh, Linux being difficult has nothing to do with people not being willing to share their knowledge or that there's knowledge that's hidden out there. It's difficult to find. No, that's actually, that's not a Linux problem. That's, you would have that same problem on Windows. You were using probably Windows or Mac before you came to Linux, right? The only reason that you didn't have this same problem on those operating systems is because you were a much different computer user on those operating systems, probably. You probably didn't do much deep diving, you know, customizing, those operating systems, proprietary software, they're kind of locked down. You know, on Linux, you have all of this freedom to do what you want. And that's why you're exploring these new topics and you're searching for this information. It's the same way on Windows or on Mac. If you were an advanced user on those operating systems and you were really trying to know the nuts and bolts of the operating system and all of this other stuff, yeah, it's a steep learning curve. You would have to really try hard to find all the information for this stuff and you know, this is not a Linux problem. It's not a Windows problem. It's not a computer problem. It's not a tech problem. This is a life problem, right? Yeah, nobody is just going to give you all of the information you seek because nobody knows what the hell you want. Nobody's going to package everything up that you for your use case, for everything that's going on in your head. Here's everything you want to know in this neat little package. No, this is in, in life for everyone. We all have to 
find our own path. We all have to seek the information that is right for us. And yes, it's, it's all over the place, right? It's in wikis, right? It's in books. It's in other people's minds, right? Sometimes you just have to have a conversation with people and get their perspective on things. So this is, I, I don't think that's the case at all. I don't think Linux is difficult because the knowledge is hidden. I don't think Linux is difficult because Linux users are somehow unwilling to share their knowledge. I don't think, I, I don't see that. Moving on to the next question. This comes from the video I did showing Debian 12 in a virtual machine. He writes, hey DT, are you installing this in VirtualBox? If so, were you able to activate the shared clipboard at all? No, I actually installed Debian 12 in Vert Manager on that video. Vert Manager uses QEMU, but sometimes I'll do my videos installing some of these Linux distributions in VirtualBox. I kind of swap between the two. Sometimes I use Vert Manager, sometimes I use VirtualBox. But setting up a shared clipboard in VirtualBox is rather easy. All you need to do, make sure you have installed the VirtualBox guest editions, and then after that, when you create your virtual machine, Go into the settings for the virtual machine, go into the general tab, and uh, I think there's some advanced settings in there for one of the things is the shared clipboard. There'll be a drop down menu. Make sure you set the shared clipboard to bi-directional. I'll include a screenshot of this in this video. The next question is, hey DT, why don't you try installing Mac OS on a non-Mac computer using Hackintosh? While Mac OS is proprietary software, it's not really Mac OS that I want you to cover. I want just a video about the hoops you jump through to get an installation working fully as I thought it would be an interesting topic for you to cover. Okay, well there's some reasons why you haven't seen any Hackintosh coverage on this channel. For one thing, there are some legality issues with that. I mean, trying to install the Mac operating system on a non-Mac computer, I'm not sure the legality behind that, and I don't want to even put that on camera and post it to YouTube, right? That could be dangerous. Another thing I don't want is I don't promote proprietary software at all, proprietary operating systems like the Mac OS. I've never done that right it's all about free and open source operating systems on this channel mostly linux but sometimes bsd uh, haiku uh, react os things like that so you're not going to get any mac os coverage the other thing that i don't want to do is i don't want people that are looking for an alternative to windows to move to Hackintosh, right? That, that is not a good move. That's not a better move. If anything, that's just a lateral move. I want these people to go to a better operating system. So if somebody's looking to replace Windows with a better operating system, I'm never gonna tell them, oh, install Hackintosh, right? I'm gonna tell them to install Linux because now that is an actual up move, right? That's not a lateral move. So yeah, you're not getting any Hackintosh coverage on my channel. Next up is a question about the automatic login option that exists in many Linux distributions installation programs. He writes, hey DT, when is it appropriate to enable the login automatically option? Personally, I only use it for local media PCs that have no personal info and aren't connected to the web. This is to make it easy for guests to watch movies or play games. You have the right idea on this. There are some use cases, some very specific use cases where having automatic login turned on makes sense. It's typically for kiosk kind of computers. So a public kiosk computer that anybody can use obviously doesn't need to have a username or password, right? So you typically businesses have kiosks for uh, browsing the web or usually they just are a uh, Chrome browser that opens up full screen. That way you can go to their website, maybe apply for a job, things like that. You guys, you, you guys know what kiosk computers are. So that makes sense to have those kinds of setups just log in automatically. But for a personal computer, for an actual human being like you guys, right? So on your desktops, your laptops, you should never have those things log in automatically. It is very dangerous because if you're not around, somebody could just pull up to your computer, open your laptop, and just get into your machine. No problems, right? No passwords being asked. And they can open your browser. They can see your browser history. Maybe you've got your passwords saved in some sites because, you know, a lot of people save passwords on sites they go to all the time in their browser. Maybe you have personal documents, tax documents, things like that, where they could get information like your social security number and things like that, that obviously, you know, you don't want just anybody to have that information. So in my opinion, for any kind of normal 
personal computer, you should never have that thing automatically log in. The automatic login option, the reason it exists in some of these Linux installers is because some people are setting up public kiosk type of computers with these Linux distributions. And in that particular niche case, it makes sense. Moving on, I got a lot of questions and comments the other day when I did that video about creating a DTOS ISO using the Arch ISO program and the Calamaris installer. And I'm going to sum it up with two questions that I got. Hey DT, do it with Debian very please. And hey DT, I was wondering if you could add open box to your DTOS ISO. Okay, so I get this all the time regarding DTOS, especially the post installation script that's designed for Arch Linux. Hey, can you make DTOS work with Debian? Gentoo, or Fedora, or whatever it happens to be, Slackware. Uh, NixOS is a common one I get. No, I can't. That's a lot of work. I would have to literally scrap everything I've done to make it work on Arch and start all over, right? And I would have to build my own repos for Debian, for example, or NixOS. I'd have to rewrite all the package builds and everything. It, it, it's a nightmare, right? I, I, can't, I can't make it work on every Linux distribution. It's just impossible. It's too much work. I've chose Arch Linux because Arch Linux kind of makes sense for this, right? And the other one, uh, can, can I add an open box session to DTOS? I could, I probably won't though, but I, I, I wouldn't rule it out in the future. Again, I can't, I'm not trying to add every window manager and every desktop environment to this thing. It was mainly a proof of concept. You guys kind of wanted something. You guys wanted an easy way to deploy my dot files and things like that. So I put DTOS out there, but I don't want it to be practically a full-time job. And if I tried to do all of this, I would really spend all of my time working on nothing but DTOS and I don't want to do that. You don't need me to install OpenBox on DTOS. I bet you can figure that out and if you want my configs, I've got configs over on my dot files repo over on my GitLab. And the next question, hey DT, how do you cope with baldness? Moving on, a comment that I've gotten several times over the last few weeks is, hey DT, as a YouTuber, you really should get a quieter keyboard. I don't know. I actually made the conscious choice to get these clicky tactile keys and they're not overly loud. They are loud, but they're not super loud. There are certainly sets of key switches that I could get that would be much louder than these, but I like them because they do make a little noise and I like that for my personal use, right? I, I, I didn't buy this for uh, for you guys right these are the keyboards that i like to use and if for whatever reason you don't like it uh, on the videos oh well i think most of you probably do though because i i don't get this comment that much i've had a few people complain that the the keyboard noises kind of drive them a little insane but because of the type of videos i do mostly where i'm typing in a terminal or typing in emacs things like that having that little feedback that i'm actually typing while you guys are watching the screen and the the characters are appearing is it really that bad let me know in the comments down below should i get quieter key switches and the final question hey dt which distro and window manager do you use and why also do you care about desktop minimalism and that's the one we're going to focus on mostly is the desktop minimalism because most of you guys that have watched my videos for a while you guys know that i run arco linux on my main production workstation here in this office and that i run arco linux on my home computer as well now why do i run arco linux on these machines it's because I installed Arco Linux on these machines and it's working. Right? I, I don't distro hop, you know, not on my personal equipment. If I install something and it's working, I don't hop. Um, it, and now, granted, what I'm actually running on this machine is nothing like Arco Linux out of the box because I have my own configs with DTOS, my own repos, my own packages. There's very little resemblance of what is actually on this machine to what actually ships with Arco Linux out of the box. So, but Arco Linux is definitely the base of this operating system. As far as the window manager I use, I have about 12 window managers installed on my computer. Typically these days, you see me either running either Xmonad or Qtile as the window manager when I'm doing my videos. And the reason I use those particular window managers is because I have them well set up as far as key bindings and desktop layouts. It makes it easier when I'm recording my desktop on camera. Moving on to the second part of this question, do I care about desktop minimalism? It depends on what we're talking about because 
desktop minimalism. Are we talking about, do I want a desktop that doesn't have a lot of features? Because that would be a minimal desktop. So something like DWM, for example, it's a window manager that is written in less than 2000 lines of code and it has practically no features, right? DWM is such a minimal window manager as far as features go that it's practically unusable out of the box. You actually have to patch DWM, right? And add more code to it and then recompile DWM to actually make it usable because you have to add certain features that I think most computer users expect to have been there out of the box that with DWM aren't there. I don't care about that kind of minimalism. When I talk about minimalism being important, I'm not saying that software shouldn't have features, right? That, that's a wrong kind of minimalism. Now, some people do appreciate that kind of minimal, minimalism, but I think that's more of an opinion. Some people's opinions will vary on that. But when I talk about a desktop being minimal, I'm talking about, is it lightweight? Is it light on system resource usage? That I care about because that's actually important. For example, the GNOME desktop takes a, over one gigabyte of RAM to boot on a cold boot. That's a lot of wasted RAM that could be better spent in some of my actual programs, like Caden Live, for example. My Caden Live video editor will actually use all the RAM I can give it. But if 1.5 gigabytes of that RAM that I could have given it is being sucked up by the GNOME desktop environment, that's a problem, right? Because there are other desktop environments and window managers, I mean, there's standalone window managers that I could use that seriously take 200, maybe 300 megabytes of RAM on a cold boot just to boot into. So think about all of that extra RAM that would be available if I chose that particular window manager over something really heavy like GNOME. And GNOME is probably the heaviest one of the bunch. The Deepin desktop is also very heavy. The, the Deepin desktop is super heavy as far as CPU usage because it has all the animations and the blurring effects, you know, the Gaussian blurring that's going on in the menus and things. It looks really pretty. And I know some computer users appreciate aesthetics. For me, I'm more about function over looks and I don't want all of my CPU and RAM being used for something just to look good, right? Because at the end of the day, the computer is still here to actually get work done. Now, before I go, I need to thank a few special people. I need to thank the producers of this episode. And of course, I'm talking about Gabe, James, Matt, Paul, Royal, Wes, Armor, Dragon, Commander Angry, George, Lee, Methos, Nate, Erion, Paul, Peace, Arch, and Vador, Realities for Less, Red Prophet, Roland, Tools Devler, War Gentoo, and Ubuntu, and Willie. These guys, they're my highest tiered patrons over on Patreon. Without these guys, this episode of Hey DT would not have been possible. The show is also brought to you by each and every one of these fine ladies and gentlemen. All these names you're seeing on the screen right now, these are all my supporters over on Patreon. I don't have any corporate sponsors. I'm sponsored by you guys, the community. If you like my work and want to see more videos about Linux and free and open source software, subscribe to DistroTube over on Patreon. Peace.